Welcome, welcome, welcome to our first Bookachino Live book group event of the year, where our guest this evening is going to be Lisa C. And we are going to be discussing her New York Times bestselling novel, Lady Tan's Circle of Women, her 10th novel, which has received so much praise, including that this past Saturday, it was announced by RUSA, a division of the American Library Association, that is their best historical novel of 2023. It's also a finalist for the Book of the Month Club's 2023 Best Book of the Year, and it was a Goodreads finalist for Best Historical Novel of 2023. I am so happy to see all this praise for my friend Lisa C's book, because it was also one of my favorite books of 2023. And, you know, it's one of those books where people say, what would you read? Oh, you want to, you will read this one. And I have a, a literary agent friend that said, can you just tell Lisa I hand sold 10 of these? Because I loved it just as much as well. And I love when people feel that way. And I know that a lot of you here tonight feel that way is I just want to hand this book and say, you're going to enjoy this. Well, the format for tonight is going to be as follows. Let me start by noting that we are assuming uh, that everyone here has read the book as we will be talking spoilers. I will begin with a discussion with Lisa, and then we'll be joined by a couple of our readers. And then we're going to take questions from the audience from the Q&A. So as the evening goes on, drop your questions into the Q&A down below, which will be only shared with the panelists. And our esteemed editorial director, Tom Donatio, will be monitoring that. And then what we'll do is in the Q and uh, chat area, if you can just say the city and state you're from, we would love to see that and look at the chat later on. And if you have anything else to share, you can put that there as well. So with that housekeeping behind us, I wanna welcome my good friend, Lisa C to the stage. Hello. Hi Lisa, so good to see good you. Time. There you go, there you go. So you have this really wonderful story about how you came to discover Lady Tan. And can you share that with us? Because to me, it's like, wait a second, how did this happen? Yeah, I mean, it is this weird thing how stories come to me, you know, is it fate, fortune, destiny, good luck, bad luck, dumb luck? And so actually for this one, you have to kind of scroll back in time about five years. I had gone out on book tour for the hardcover of the Island of Sea Women. When I came back, I started doing research for what I thought was going to be the next book. And then um, a year later, the paperback for Island of Sea Women came out. I went out on book tour. I left on March 10th, 20. And I went to five states in five days. And then the tour was canceled. The country shut down. And then the whole world shut down. And remember how we all thought it was going to be two weeks? <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> and, um, but it turned out not to be two weeks. And you would think that, you know, this is an ideal situation for a writer. You're home. You can't do anything else. You can't talk. You know, then you can just stay and write. The problem was that all of the research libraries, all of the libraries, all of the archives were closed. But most importantly, so was China. Mm -hmm. And... Um, that particular book was going to require a trip deep, deep, deep into a very remote part of China. No way to do that in 2020, 2021, 2022. And, you know, only the, the big um, quarantines only ended a year ago. But even now, I'd be very reluctant to go anywhere in the world still that would be there. Anyway, so I have to tell you, and you know this, I didn't handle that time very well. <laughs> Home alone, 24 hours. I can't leave the house. I can't go anywhere. <laughs> I can't do what I do. And I I just, I mean, I don't mean to sound melodramatic, but there was a part of me that just felt like, well, my life is over. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't know what was going to happen. I was just like, well, you know, everything I know is done. And I just really moped around. I mean, and and, you know, I, there was a highlight. I bought my first ever pair of pajamas. You know, I bought my second ever pair of pajamas. And that's the end of my pajama story. I mean, that, you know, but I, I didn't bake banana bread, but I got pajamas. So it wasn't until October of that year. So a lot of months from March till October that I was walking by here. I probably walk back and forth at least 10 times a day. And I, I, you're only seeing a portion of it, but it's a whole wall of research books. 
And the spine of one of them kind of jumped out at me. I don't know why. A gray jacket with slightly darker gray lettering, um, reproducing women, pregnancy, and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I pulled it down. I opened it up. I had that on my book for 10 years. Not only had I not read it, I had never opened it before. I mean, you could feel, you know, crack, crack, crack. <laughs> And I thought to myself, well, you know, here we are in the middle of a global pandemic. My life is over. I might as well sit down and start reading it. And so I did. I sat down right over there. I started reading. I got to page 19. And there was this mention of a woman doctor 500 years ago, which seemed pretty amazing, um, who, when she turned 50, another fact I liked a lot, published a book of her medical cases in 1511. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I want to see if I can look up anything more about her. So I came right here, just started poking around and discovered that her book was available, you know, still in print, not just in Chinese, but also in English. And while I am a huge, huge, huge supporter of independent bookstores, I had to order that book on you know, Amazon. <laughs> and I had 24 hours. And so instead of thinking about this for like 5, 10, 15, 20 years, like I usually do, it was all of 26 hours. Wow. Wow. And you, so you couldn't travel, you couldn't do your usual boots on the ground research, but you still could reach out to people and you could reach out to people. And you had one really interesting connection that you made that was close by, but still far away at this point. Yeah, so the first person I wanted to find was the woman who had translated miscellaneous records of a female doctor into English. And I'm you know, sitting here again, you know, looking, trying to find her. You know, she could have been anywhere in the world. And she turned out to live in Santa Monica, 10 minutes from me. And while we couldn't, we still couldn't see, I'm just long before vaccine, still couldn't see each other. We did talk on Zoom a couple times a week. And actually, We've just been emailing again because um, I there's some a little bit of the research that I'm doing for the next book that she's been able to help me with. And have you met in person at this point? Yeah. After okay. time on. But I mean, it took a long time before. We <laughs> you know, you write in the first person. What does that bring to your writing of I'm in that character? Is that the reason you do it? Or where does that come from? I have editor once who told me, and I don't know if this is true, but that writing in the first person is the most difficult. To me, if I can't imagine writing these, I mean, I have written stuff in the third person, but these historical novels feel very much like they should be in the first person because it literally puts me in their shoes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm in their shoes, in that room, in those clothes. And um, it really helps me to just be in in them and not just about sort of the physical you know environment but also emotionally Mm -hmm. Uh, what you know once you're in there then you can feel how that you know those emotions I think in a deeper in a deeper more literally like more visceral way yeah. And reading this book, I actually am thinking back on Lady Tan and I feel like I did know this person. I feel like at some point we had a conversation or something because it was so conversational. And I feel like I met her someplace and she was telling the story and telling what happened. And I think it's a really interesting way for you to have told a story that if you told me I was going to be interested in a doctor from the 15th century that was going to, I would say, and if you describe the book to somebody, you just have to say, just read it. Because if you get into this is what's going to happen, no, just go read it because you're going to be as immersed as I was as soon as I got there, you know, as soon as we're all done. Well, now I'm going to welcome Debbie. I, Moore. Go ahead. I felt that too while I was writing it. I was thinking, well, I mean, I find her to be fascinating, but is anybody else going to? <laughs> I know. It's like so long ago, you know, that we don't have, um, well, just generally about China, but you know, even if you had a story set in London, we don't really know how people live. I mean, that's like more than a hundred years before Shakespeare, right? So we don't have a real sense of what it was like. If you wanted to set something here in North America 500 years ago, no, you know, Mm -hmm. no 
was writing down what that experience was like. So it, it, it and it's not like there are a whole lot of movies set mm -hmm. in that. So we were all sort of starting from scratch to, to build that world and, and feel that world. Yeah, and build those characters. And once again, we went back to Bound Feet, something that once again can send a lot of people. I want to know if the um, queries about Bound Feet went up again last year on, you know, all the search engines, you know, because I know that immediately see Bound Feet, what do they look like? How do they look? What do those shoes look like? So. Mm -hmm. Oh, look at that. I uh, I, so this is, so if you think of a bound foot about the size of your, you know, ideal size, about the size of your thumb, one inch wide and three inches long. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And this one is this actual, this one is more, almost more like a little, like a galosh, you know, like a little. Orange. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just a little push your foot inside and oh, wrap around. Well, I mean, and welcome Debbie Moore, who's participated in many of our evening programs. I think all of them. And she has a few questions for you. So Debbie, you're on. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Carol. Hi, Lisa. Uh, I love all your books and my feet still hurt from Snowflower. And the <laughs> <laughs> but um, you've written books, you know, in so many different centuries with strong female characters and, and female friendships. How do new books come to you? Is it a person you want to write about? Is it a, a, a subject you want to write about or a, a relationship? How do these things come to you? There is every way you can possibly, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for your great question. Um, they come to me in every way you can imagine. I mean, everyone has been different. So with Snowflower and the Secret Fan, I had reviewed a book uh, for the LA Times on the history of foot binding. And in that book was just like a four page mention of the secret language. And while the foot binding was over there, it was that secret language that totally, totally obsessed me. Mm -hmm. And um, that was it. I mean, I just had to find out more and more, whatever I could. I mean, there was very little out there back then. So, you know, there did come this point when I said to my husband, Honey, there's only one thing I can do. I have to go to China to see what I can find. And that particular area that I went to, I was told I was only the second foreigner ever to go there. By my count, I was the fifth, but only the second white foreigner to go there. Um, with um, Peony and Love, I had uh, written a piece for Vogue magazine a million years ago when um, in New York there was a production, the full entire opera of the Peony Pavilion, all 55 acts, all 26 hours. I didn't get to see it, but they had me write a little piece about it. And while I was doing the research, I came across um, the the uh, so-called lovesick maidens in the 17th century. who, When they read, they weren't allowed to see the opera, but when they read it, they would catch cases of lovesickness like the main character in the novel, uh, in, the, in the opera and waste away and die. But as they were dying, they would write poems and stories that are still in print today. And I just thought that was, you know, so amazing. Okay, so just one more, just to give you a, well, I'll do two more really fast. So, um, couple books later, I'd been going out on book tour, these really long, like three months a year out on the road when I was exhausted. And my husband was really tired of having me be away. He, I'm happy to say he loves me. <laughs> and so we had gone to visit our one of our sons at college and we were driving home. I don't, I see a lot of people here from California. So coming down Interstate 5, which is a hideous, hideous drive. And um, I was just trying to think about what to write about. And I didn't want to go on a big research trip. I, I didn't want to get on another plane. And so I was thinking about, you know, could, is there something I could write about Los Angeles Chinatown? But who would the characters be? And my husband said, well, I don't know why, but you've never written about sisters. And, and so, you know, Either I am an only child, I am the only child of my mother and father, but I have a half sister that's my mother's daughter, a half sister, my father's daughter, and a, and a former stepsister. We've known each other now for almost 60 years. So either I'm an only child or I'm one of four sisters. <laughs> and it was a 
drive coming home. It's how I that that story came out of that conversation. And then just last, you know, super fast um, with um, Island of Sea Women. I was in a doctor's office waiting to be called in, flipping through magazines like we. Oops, everybody's frozen. I don't know if it's me. About these diving women, I ripped that right out of the magazine and brought it home. So you can see every every single one has has been completely different. There's been no pattern to it. It's just like random flying through the universe. <laughs> How about the little girl walking down the street with the ponytail in her hair and this yeah. the ponytail and that inspired the book? Um, what interested you about ancient Chinese medicine, especially the role of women in medicine? Um, were there women in your family that were healers? No. No, no. I, I just, well, uh, to me, you know, if you think about how many books are still in print, from before 1511. You know, there's the Bible, the Iliad and the Odyssey, some Greek tragedies and comedies. We can go beyond the Western canon, see the Mahabharata from India, um, I Ching and Book of Odes from China, all of them written by men. Uh, there are a couple of books that have survived that were written by women, um, Tales of Genji from Japan. Uh, there's um, a 11th century, sorry, 12th century Catholic nun, Hildegard von Bingen, who wrote mm -hmm. two books, actually quite similar to what Han Yun Chen did in the sense that they have these um, recipes for home, to how, how to make a remedy at home for your sore throat, your cough, gout, how to get pregnant, how to end an unwanted pregnancy. This Catholic nun had a recipe for that. But these are very, very few and far between. And it's you know a long time before we start to see people like the Bronte sisters, um, Jane Austen, um, George Sand, Edith Wharton. You know, not a lot of them. And it's not until about a hundred years ago uh, when Virginia Woolf starts writing, you know, and publishing in the 1920s that you see women start to get published, and those books stay in print, be viable, and are read today. And so to me, that that was the thing that I'm just like, you know, yes, a woman doctor 500 years ago, not to not a whole lot of them in the world. And, you know, that she did this when she was 50 and that, and that this was, you know, published 500 years ago, but still in print and important today. And the reason it's still in print is because so many of her remedies are still used in traditional Chinese medicine. Oh, yeah. Um, the relationship, I'm sorry, I, I know I'm going to mispronounce these names, but the relationship between Zhen Yan and Mei Ling is fraught with problems caused by class, occupation, personality, yet they continue to find each other despite their differences. And many of your books contain these types of relationships between women. Do you think there's something unique about female relationships or at least the way women relate to each other? I, absolutely, I do. You know, this is a unique relationship that we have in our lives. It's completely different than any other relationship that we have. We will tell a friend something that we wouldn't tell our boyfriend, our husband, our lover, our mother, our children. It's a very, very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, whenever you have that, whenever your heart is open, you are vulnerable to being hurt. And so all for all the good things that we get out of friendship, the love, the support, laughter, a shoulder to cry on, all, you know, the shared experience, all the good things, there is this dark shadow side. Mm -hmm. And I see those dark shadows, that's where I want to go. Um, and finally, do you think the idea of a circle of women or a circle of friends is unique to women and, and the unique way that women see their relationships Well, I can't say that I know enough about men to know if you know if they have that in the same way that women do. Um, you know, I think that there's a reason, for example, that book clubs, not entirely all women, but you know, mostly women, that women, um, you know, what happens in a book club? You come together once a month, 
maybe you have wine, maybe you don't, maybe you share a meal, maybe you don't, but you're, you're talking about the book, but you're also, it's an opportunity to talk about your own life, your own emotions, what you're going through. And I, and I think that that's kind of a really like tangible example of, of how women form these circles. And, you know, that's that circle, they may not be your best buddies, there's a particular circle that's come together in a kind of common cause and maybe you have a group of I play tennis you know a group of people you play tennis with these aren't I hope nobody's on here who's part of that but these aren't like my closest friends in life but they are they are a particular group of friends that we have this common interest that we like to share together that we have a real time together um, and one of them Tess who lives up the street I can count on her to know the best plumber, the best handyman, the best plumber I need. She knows who it is. So that way, she's my very, very best friend in the world. Um, well, thank you so much. I've read all your books. I've enjoyed them all. I can't wait for the next one. And um, I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, for being such a great, great, great person. To, we can count on you for at all of these events to bring us good questions. So thank you for doing that. I'm in a book group. It's funny with women that are um, about 20 years younger than I am. And I have such a good time with them because they talk about their children and they talk about all these things that are like alien to my life right now, but bring back great memories. <laughs> and I'm like, I am so glad I'm not dealing with this right now. So I'm going to bring up a question I actually came in on my phone just as we were going on from Carol Kingsley from Wakes Forest in North Carolina. Were there sections of the book that were more enjoyable for you to write? And were there other chapters, events, scenarios that were more challenging? She said she loved this book. Um, their book group chose it for their March gathering. Um, so, yeah, there are always parts that are harder to write or easier to write or you know fun to write I, I I really do love that last scene in the dragon boat races just because it's something these women have longed for for such a long time um and it sort of shows the change in life of, of everyone but for me I have to say and I'm just going to sound like the most gruesome person the more gruesome the scene the more I love writing it so I mean, I, when I, I'll just say there are three stories just off the top of my head that um, did not happen to Tanya and Shun, but did happen to real women. So the st story of the worm, um, the message that's written on the baby's foot uh, during childbirth, and then the uh, midwife who miscarried in front of the empress known as the compassionate one, and then what happened to her. Those were all true stories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm like doing research and I'm reading along and I came across that story of the worm and I'm just like, oh my God, I cannot use that. And so, you know, for me, it's like, okay, so where is that going to be in the story? Is the beginning, the middle, the end? Why is it there? What's the ripple effect? But the anticipation I had as the writer, you know, I have to lay in some clues that the play that uh, lady quo keeps doing you know there's a reason for that um but the closer i got to getting to actually write that scene and i was just so excited once once i got there you know <laughs> i've been waiting 200 pages for this so um there are certain things like that that it, you know on the face of it don't seem like they would be um particularly fun or enjoyable but it's just like i've been waiting so long to get to this I'm ready. Yeah, the, and yeah, I, somebody just typed the worm is nasty. And I was like, yes, but you definitely remember that part of the book. Just you definitely remember what happened there. You know, it's um, for um, we're going to have Michelle join us. Michelle Morell. Let me see. Here comes Michelle. Good, good, good. Um, Michelle has been on with us a number of times as well. So we welcome you joining us tonight. And Michelle, what's your question? Hi, Lisa. This is such a pleasure to be on here with you. And, and like Debbie, I'm a huge super fan. I've read all your books. Um, I, I actually have a little bit more of a general question. Um, so while I was doing some research and I was looking at your website, it kind of ended up down a rabbit hole, which led me um, to your mother, Carolyn C., an author that I who I learned about. Um, but I watched a really fascinating interview with her uh, promoting her book, Making a Literary Life. 
Um, and I was super intrigued with her writing advice. I'm, I'm trying to write a novel myself. Um, and one piece of advice that she gave writers was that writers should write a thousand words a day, five days a week, um, and also write a charming note to another author or someone who makes your palms sweat, she had said. So I kind of wondered if you took that advice yourself from your mother or if you have any other advice that you you have for writers. Um, well, and I figured so this I is a great question. I you were going to ask this question. However, yes, I write a thousand. When I'm writing, I write a thousand words a day and I even keep a notebook with my daily word count. So, you know, on 918, it was 1,251. On 925, it was 1,142. On 926, 1,008. But on 927, only 582. But I do keep track. And it's it's a way um, for me to kind of be responsible and, and realize the goal is 1,000 words. I don't, obviously, I don't. Here's one, 244. I don't always get there. But I you can't see this, but I put these little marks so that it shows the week. So, you know, sometimes I've done a little more. If I if I can, well, when I'm writing, if I can do that, you know, four to 5,000 words a week. Yeah, and, and um, you know, back in the day, I, I, I mean, I actually am known for my handwritten notes. Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I really am a big believer in that. And, but, you know, now there's so much email, but I, you know, I have a website. People can write to me through my website and I answer every email. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, it's not, I mean, I've had people write to me and, you know, they'll write, I write back, they write, I write back. And then a couple of times people have written and said, well, I know you're not actually Lisa, but whoever you are, you're very nice. <laughs> no, it's really me. <laughs> it's really me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to feel, um, I mean, I, I, I think it's a little different now when I'm sort of at this stage in my career, but I feel it's really important to answer every reader who, mm -hmm. who writes me. I mean, I am so grateful for that. And um, less so if I, won't you please publish me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of that um, writing is about. And, you know, for you, um, I would say, you know, write a thousand words a day, write that, write that note, because you, you're wanting to make connections to people. And there is nothing like a, a handwritten note. I mean, how many do you get anymore? Mm -hmm. Very little. I mean, I noticed this year, you know, what used to be a pile of holiday cards is now like this, because most come in an email, it's not the same thing. So I think we value that. And then the other thing I would say is to be really passionate about what you're writing. And I always use this example that it, you know, it, 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 writing a novel or a book, it's not a one night stand. This is like marriage. You are in it for the long haul. And the difference between a one night stand and being married, you know, is there are gonna be a lot of bumps along the way. And there's so many bumps in writing. You know, some days you have a bad day where you only write the 243 words, whatever that was. Um, sometimes you get stuck. Sometimes the editor doesn't like what you've written. Sometimes readers don't like what you've written. I had an, I answered an email today from a woman who said, uh, wrote, Sherelle wrote and said, you know, I read Shanghai Girls many years ago and I really hated that book. <laughs> Her email started, but she said, then I reread it just now, and it, it, I liked it a lot more this time around. I, you know, it's like, well, I'm sorry you didn't like it that first time, but, um, you know, sometimes people don't like it. Sometimes critics don't like it. Sometimes it's just a bad situation. Like, I mean, I have a friend who worked 10 years on a book that came out in March 2020. Mm -hmm. and it came and went and it just, just, you know, but all those years. So there are things that some, you can't anticipate. So that if you have this deep, deep love for what you're doing, that's what keeps you going forward. 
And that's, you know, the, the, that's the thing that it, it doesn't matter what this other stuff is happening around you because your love is true. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I don't know. That's Just great advice. Yeah. And, and, and not, not one that I've heard before. So thank you so much. Really Michelle, that. a thousand words tomorrow. Just remember a that. Thousand words. And I like the notebook idea because then you can see you only did 200. I mean, I keep my calendar in Excel and I do it for a reason. I can move things very easily to the next column, very easily. And unlike Lisa, if I ever wrote a handwritten note, they used to think uh, my children, um, when they brought notes to school, they thought I was a doctor. <laughs> they said, what kind of doctor is your mother? I'm like, oh, no, my mother does writing. <laughs> I heard out 1B and it was in fourth grade for handwriting. Mm. Yeah, I never perspected penmanship at all. Never. You have such pretty handwriting. And then they look at it and they said, but what does it say? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of looks pretty, but you can't read it. Can't read it. Can't read it at all. Thanks again, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you. So Lisa, what I really want you to do is talk about the marriage bed, because I know you've got a photo of this on your website and you saw one in real life. And I want to make sure that people who haven't investigated on your website yet know about the step inside section and what you put there, because it gives, if you're in a book club of one, and a lot of people that are here tonight are probably in a book club of one, and you want to go out and learn more, let's talk about the resources there and what readers are going to find. Yeah, so with, I, I have a step inside for every book. It's like step inside the world of sea women, step inside the world of Tigra, whatever it is, step inside the world of Shanghai girls. So, um, you know, it has all the, the sort of background history and resources. So we were talking earlier about bound feet, you know, that there set a section on bound feet that will show uh, maybe what an x-ray of a foot or photographs of old women who had their feet bound or, you know, the, the embroidery on shoes. Um, what these old houses looked like, what the gardens looked like. Uh, what stuff about the clothes and maybe hairstyles, hair um, ornaments, makeup, all, all of those things that are sort of the, the, the history behind the book. And, you know, sometimes I can have photographs of that, this place, what it looked like in, let's say, 1937 and what it looks like today. So, you know, just all, all kinds of different ways, um, links to videos, not that I've done, but let's say of the Henya that I wrote about in Island of Sea Women, where you can actually see them diving and yeah. see them talking and stuff like that. So it, it's, a, it's a way to sort of be like a one-stop shopping for, for readers or for book clubs um, to, to look at, you know, what, what, what is all this <laughs> instead of looking it up for yourself. Yeah. Instead of just Googling on your own, just go there and you'll see the marriage bed and you'll see exactly Lisa sitting inside. So you get an idea of what the scope and the size of everything is. That's what I really love is that after you've read the book, you can go in and have an, an experience just yourself, even if you're not doing it with your group and learn something. And it's the kind of thing where you can do it in sections. You can say, I'm going to read this part today. I'm going to read this and then go back and look at the book and see where it made sense to you from there. Yeah. So well, Tom, I know that our voice of God, Tom Donatio, our brilliant editorial director, is probably looking at questions and has some to share. So, Tom, am I correct? You are correct about that. We have a lot of good questions here. Um, I thought we'd just start off, first things first, with a question from Naomi. She says, how do you pronounce the name of your main character? Tan Yan Xian. So, uh, you know, if you've read others of my books, I try usually to stay away from the actual Chinese names, especially if they have an X or a Q. So in this pinyin system of transliteration, they use X and Q, and it's not pronounced like how we pronounce Xs and Qs. So I've always tried to stay away from that. But in this book, I had her actual name. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't have a choice. I mean, I had to use her name, but it is it is hard to pronounce, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not how we pronounce an X necessarily. Right. Um, Laura says, as I read this lovely book, I envisioned the Chinese gardens at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. To my delight, I read in your notes at the end of the book that it served as an inspiration for you as well. 
Can you talk a bit more about how you provided so much detail about gardens, landscapes, and living environments without having been able to visit these settings in China while writing? So, first of all, great question. And I, it sounds like somebody who's actually been to the Chinese garden. If all of the rest of you out there ever come to Southern California, please go visit the Huntington. It's just spectacular. So, um, you know, I couldn't do research in the ways that I usually do. But by now, I do feel like I have a kind of bag of knowledge. And one of them has to do with these how these old houses, I mean, these big compound homes. And so, um, you know, I've been to many of them over the years. Uh, I've even stayed in one when I was doing research for Peony and Love. Um, but, you know, the one that this is most closely modeled on was, I can't even remember what book it was, but I've been in the interior of China and was making my way back to Beijing to fly home. And the driver was like, yeah, I want to, you know, let's stop and I want to show you this house. And so this one was huge. It was the home of a form of a salt merchant, who, the man who controlled the salt in this area. And it had 55 bedrooms, just the bedrooms alone, 54 bedrooms and different pavilions and courtyards and everything. And actually, as I was walking around, I was like, this looks vaguely familiar. And it's because it was used in the filming of Raise the Red Lantern, if anyone has ever seen that movie. Or you can now watch it, you know, yeah. you can watch it and think, oh, this is what these houses look like. And then the other one really had to do with the garden. And um, also for Peony and Love, I spent a lot of time um, in the area near where she, she was from, Hangzhou. Um, uh, the main character in real life. Um, and but near Hangzhou is Suzhou. And Suzhou is known for these big private gardens. And probably the most well known is the humble administrator's garden. The Chinese garden at the Huntington is modeled very much on the humble administrator's garden. So I've been to the humble administrator's garden many times, and I've been to the Huntington's Chinese garden many, 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 many times. Um, and uh, it is the largest traditional Chinese garden in the, anywhere in the world outside of China. And um, I'll just say that I wrote an opera, uh, the libretto for an opera of On Gold Mountain, my first book, and LA Opera did a production of the opera in the Chinese garden, I think it's two years ago now. So I've spent a lot of time there. You know, what questions came up? I want to answer real quick. Somebody oh, said, what's oh, Lisa's oh, website? And I, I said, lisac.com. I didn't, sorry, Carol, I didn't finish the question. Oh, sort of thinking about the philosophy behind these gardens and how stones represent mountains and how you you're like creating the universe but within within a garden and again it sounds like that person had, had um, been to the Chinese garden how you have windows that look through or or through a um, like a pagoda or a temple kind of thing where you look through and this is giving you a very particular vista like a painting but that painting is really you're trying to imitate the wild of nature you know, so it's partly taming nature but it's also bringing the universe you know bringing the whole universe or world into this smaller space especially for women who couldn't go out right yeah uh, sounds amazing. Amazing. Lisa's website is lisac.com. Somebody was asking before of where you could get step into and all these um, fabulous, fabulous background materials. Tom, another question? All right. Um, yeah. Myra uh, wants to know if you do all of your own research for your books. I do it all because I, I for me, it is my favorite part of the whole process. Um, I absolutely love it. To me, it's like a treasure hunt. You know, I never know what I'm going to find. And so it's things like, oh my God, where? <laughs> you know, now I'm going to use it. Somebody else, if I had, you know, if they, somebody else if had been doing that, would have just thought, ew, you know, a worm? No, I'm not going to show that to her. So I, I love the research. And a book typically takes me about two years. 
the, the research is the, takes the largest amount of time. The writing is actually the least amount of time. And then the editing is somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Um, now, Deborah wants to know, did you research Confucius? He was so responsible for the subjugation of Chinese women. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I have um, done a fair amount of research, less on Kim than on his philosophy and his views on the world. And I think it's very fair to say that this was a great thinker and a great philosopher. There's no question about that. But he really didn't care for women. So all of these sayings, uh, when a girl obey your father, when a wife obey your husband, when a widow obey your son, um, an educated woman is a worthless woman. That's a nice one. Mm -hmm. uh, a good woman should never go more than three steps beyond her front gate. And what one of the things that really struck me about Tan Yan Chen is that she she presents as a very traditional Confucian woman. She gets married in an arranged marriage when she's 15. She has four children. She took care of her husband's home. Um, and yet, somehow, she... She was definitely educated mm -hmm. and did go more than three steps beyond her front gate. And this was actually one of the things that really sparked my curiosity at the very beginning was if this was a woman, who, you know, most of her cases are believed to be the women and girls who live in this family compound, whether they're the sort of elite women and girls or the servants who took care of them. But there are these other cases, the the pillar woman on the ship, the um, brick and tile maker, those were real cases that she had. So how did she meet them? And so this was one of the things that, uh, so, you know, in my imagination is I have to figure out how she did that. You know, how did she meet them? She had to have gotten out somehow. How did she leave? How did she leave? Became your whole, a question for a day of a thousand words of writing, how she left the house. Um, Judith, wants to know, how did the grandmother get to be a physician? You know, she was what was known as a hereditary doctor. So the grandfather was a was a literati doctor. Someone, he, after he retired from the Board of Punishments, he decided he wanted to treat people. And so he learned how to be a writer, but how to be a doctor by reading books, you know, a literati doctor. But her grandmother was a hereditary doctor had learned from her parents, who'd learned from their parents, and so on. And so in that way, you know, Tan Yan Chen is a little bit of a combination because there's, her, you know, it's her grandfather who's the one who says, this little girl is too smart just to have to confine her. I mean, this is his exact words. She's too smart to confine her to just doing embroidery. We should teach her my medicine. But of course, it's really her grandmother who teaches her. Now, the, the big question is, why didn't she teach her daughters? Mm. And no one knows the answer to that. I mean, scholars have really tried to figure out what, you know, why did it end with her? That's interesting. Another um, question about the characters. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, was Mei Ling a real person? No, but uh, can I just take a second, Carol, to sort of talk about how I thought about her? Of course. You know, there were three things I was thinking about. First, you have in Tan Yan Shen's family, all these men, her husband, her father, her grandfather, her uncle, all work for the Board of Punishments. And there could have been more, but these are the ones we know about that are in the historic record. And her grandfather was really high up in this in this system of imperial scholars. So what do these guys do? You know, the, the people who work for the Board of Punishments, their job is to go out across the country and research and investigate death. Was this an accident? Was it natural? Was there foul play involved? Uh, and so they, they are acting as the investigator, the lawyer, the judge, and also the person who decides what the punishment is going to be. So it's really very much about death. And over here you have doctors. And what do doctors do? You know, their, their job is healing. And over here were the midwives. 
Now, Confucius, who we were just talking about a minute ago, um, he one of the things he did was create this kind of hierarchy of all of the professions. And at the very, very, very bottom, 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 were people who came in physical contact with blood. So coroners, butchers, and midwives. And this was really interesting to me because what do midwives do? They're, you know, they're bringing life into the world. And yet here they, they were seen as being seen as like the most polluted people. So to me, this, this sort of triangle was really interesting. And, and that by having someone who was a midwife, that would allow me to sort of look at these, you know, this, this play around in a triangle. So you had the right character to tell the story. You had the right character to, it was the point of view, her point of view, you could look at a lot of different things from. Um, Carol asks, um, what made you decide to add the mystery to this book? Mm -hmm. Oh, such a, another, another great question. You guys are so great out there. So <laughs> I was doing the research um, I somewhere along the line, I stumbled across the washing away of wrongs. And this book, you know, is the first book in the world about forensics and published in 1247, I believe, 1240 something, and still used in China today. And uh, actually, when I was on a book tour for this book, uh, I did an event in Colorado where one of the women who came to the event, she had studied forensics here, you know, an American woman. And that was one of the textbooks that they had because um, one of the things is just how do you treat a body with respect is very much at the heart of that book. Anyway, if you've ever watched a single episode of CSI, all the different CSIs, it, you could have a series that would go for 20 years just using this one book. And believe me, I thought about it. <laughs> There's so many, like, here's, you know, here's this, like, what happened to the, anyway. So I, again, this was sort of tied in to that whole idea of the board of punishments, healing, and midwives, but how you would look at death. And so, you know, um, you know, it is related to health and, and well-being. So I, I just um, you know, thought all that stuff was fascinating. And it, I mean, I don't think of it as being like a deep, deep mystery. You know, it's not it's not Michael Connelly mystery, but it but it is sort of in there. And I and I uh, really enjoyed doing that. I mean, my, you know, my second, third and fourth books for mysteries. So it was a really fun to be able to kind of go back to that format, even though overall you wouldn't label that book a mystery. Um, Gail says, you had spoken previously as to why she did not pass down her medical knowledge. I thought that may interest everyone. I'm sorry, say it again? You had spoken previously as to why she did not pass down her medical knowledge. I thought that may interest everyone. Yeah, I mean, they, they don't, nobody knows why she didn't do it. Um, what What is known about her is, you know, she lived to be 96. This is really a remarkably old age today, but especially back then. Um, her nephew, you know, at that very last page, um, and in real life, you know, there are these forewords and afterwards that are written by mostly men in her family, kind of testimonials, uh, but also describing different aspects of her life. Anyway, he was the one, you know, after she died, her, weirdly enough, her book, you know, sort of fell off the bookshelves and you couldn't find it in the local bookstore. And he wanted to save it from disappearing, you know, forever. And so he searched around, found a copy. He uh, transcribed it with Russian ink. He paid to have the woodblocks printed. He, um, you know, paid to have it published. And, and that's the version that has survived to today. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I actually have a Xerox copy of, of the real pages of the book. And I think, I think Carol, I think that's in step inside. It is step inside, yeah. Um, 
So that's the version that survived today. Anyway, in his last piece, what he wrote about was sort of what happened to her, you know, what his journey was and why he wanted to do this, but what happened to her. And, you know, we've all agreed we can have spoilers. So um, her son, but also all the men, male descendants in her family were killed in a political purge. And so, you know, one question that people have is, she wrote this book when she, and published it when she was 51. Everyone says she became a much better doctor over time, that she became so good that she could actually look at someone and see through their body to what was alien. So like a, like a, like a mystical um, doctor. Uh, and but why why didn't she ever publish anything else and so he speculated two things that one after she died maybe someone just threw them out just thought well nobody needs that stuff you know and if any of you out there have ever had to take apart someone's life i've had to do it now four times you know there's stuff you look at and you think well that's going in the trash bin you know i don't have a use for that and so maybe that is what happened um, the next thing, this is my pencil holder or pen holder, um, was he speculated that um, maybe some servants had torn pages out of the books and then used them on um, gin, on, on um, preserved jars. So this is the one for a ginger. And so, you know, if you think about if you make jam and sometimes you see that where the, you take a little piece of paper and tie it with a string and write what, what it is, that maybe that's what happened. But nobody really knows where all of her notebooks went to. They did, he, that was his idea. And that maybe she didn't write anything anymore because since everybody, all the men in her family had been killed, that she just had to be the breadwinner. Mm. She didn't have time for that kind of thing. So, you know, again, that doesn't explain why she didn't teach medicine to her daughters it could be that she did but they were just so so doctors I mean we you know it's just no it's not written down anywhere that anybody knows the actual answer we know who her daughters married do we any know anything like that or no uh I don't think I'm trying to remember I don't think we know who the daughters married but there is about the son and who and how he got married and then he had a son because then, you know it's it's that whole line that then gets killed and um i have a question from ellie um what sparked your interest in chinese culture history and philosophy so i um, grew up in a very large chinese american family here in los angeles i lived with my mom my mom's family was tiny. When I was a kid, there were about 10 people in her family. Today, there are only four left. Um, but my father's side of the family was huge. And so uh, my great-great-grandfather came here to work on the railroad. He had four wives. He, one of them was a white woman. This was back when it was against the law for Chinese and, and whites to marry here in California. Um, there were miscegenation laws in 28 states. Uh, my great grandparents went to a lawyer who drew up a contract between two people as though they were forming a partnership. My grandparents went to Mexico to get married, and my own parents were only the second couple in our whole extended family to be legally married here in this country. Anyway, when I was a kid, and this is back when people had really big families. You know, my great grandfather had 10 children, his brother had, sorry, 12 children, his brother had 12 sons. So these were big, big families before birth control. And so when I was a kid, I had about 400 relatives on my father's side of the family here. And about a dozen that looked like me, the majority still full Chinese, and then this, this spectrum in between. And so, you know, how is it we identify ourselves? We identify ourselves by the people who are around us. They're, they're our mirror. They're the ones telling us who we are. And so when I looked around me when I was a kid, when I thought of family, you know, what I saw were Chinese faces, what I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food. And that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. Mm -hmm. Isn't it interesting right. how families changed? Isn't it interesting how family has changed so much? And, and people now, 
first of all, people are getting married later. Maybe they're having a child. Maybe they're not. If they're having a child, maybe they're having one, maybe two. You don't know hear, hear very many large families anymore. If they do, they're like a TikTok like sensation or something like that. But it's growing up, there was such a different way. Many, many aunts, many, many uncles. Family was such a big thing. You couldn't remember going to uncles' houses, trying to remember who were the children that went with who and all these kinds of things. Like in the car, like, let's remember. Yes. <laughs> um, an anonymous attendee asks, I assume the preface to miscellaneous records of a female doctor and the postscript to the reprint of miscellaneous records are nonfiction. Is that a correct assumption? So in, in her book, those are actually written by real people. What I did was I took about sort of half of the content that um, each of those had. And then, um, you know, it was also my opportunity to put other stuff in uh, that I didn't have a way to, to put in um, in her story, you know, that I couldn't, so I wanted to say something about that time period or what happened to her later, um, or what was known about what had happened to her and her family later that may or may not have been um, in those, those original things. But I, you know, I did use uh, who, I can't remember who the one is at the front, but that was a real person and the one at the back is, is her great nephew. But again, use, using about half of what he, he did in his original um, postscript. Mm. Um, Heidi says, Lady Tan is such a great book to read that I wrote a book review as my writing assignment. My question is about the name translation. As an English Chinese translator, I couldn't help but notice that some of the people's names in Lady Tan do not appear to be Mandarin pinyin, such as Dr. Wong and Mei Ling's husband, Kai Lu. I'm just curious if there are reasons for these exceptions. Um, not really. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what, um, yes, I, and I wonder if this is a person who's written to me about this, um, this issue of, of using some can uh, you know, more Cantonese style names. Um, you know, some of it is just accessibility. We were talking about that earlier with her name and, and the X's and the Q's and just trying to um, find names that work um, well for people who may not be all that familiar with Chinese names. You know, I actually modeled what I did in this book on um, what the author who wrote uh, Dream of the Red Chamber. It's also known as the a story of the stone. This is considered to be the greatest Chinese novel. And it's, it's one of these big sprawling epics. And it's mostly about one family and one of these big family compounds. And so you have the servants and the concubines and the sort of upper tier people. They're um, actually sort of a military side story. And so he had this really, you know, that the, the people at the bottom had very common names. And so I used that, you know, so, you know, the servants are Poppy and Inky and names like that. And then as you went up, you know, then people started to have titles, um, even though it's, it's not, you know, like Lady Tim, she's not officially a lady like you think of in England. Right, but this was more of a title used within um, within the culture to sort of show that you're, you're higher up on the societal um, societal level. Mm -hmm. This is something um, I was interested in wondering about too. Randy asks, the cover of the book is magnificent. Did you have input into its creation as Carol holds up of the cover as we speak? All I can say is I, my input was, oh my God, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can tell you, you know, obviously no photographs back then, no drawings or paintings have survived if, if there ever were of her. So this is actually a composite of three photo, three women, photographs of contemporary women. So she's, it's real in the sense that somewhere in there, there are three real people, 
Um, but she's a composite. And then when it first came, they actually sent different versions with different color backgrounds. So one was purple and one was you know pink and one was yellow. And I put them all around this room. But the, the green one was always my favorite and it was everybody's favorite. And Carol, I think, I think you and I may have talked about this way back then. So the book came out in June of last mm -hmm. year. Right. And so, you know, it's technically a summer book. And if you think of summer books, you know, often it's like a beach chair and pretty right. pastels and things like that, 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 right. that message of this is a beach read. This is right. a thing. Okay. This looks more like a fall book, right? It's a, it does. But, and so that was one of the big discussions was, you know, it's coming out in June and it's going to be really hot in a lot of places where people want to read it. And it turned out they did. <laughs> so that was good. And they're still reading it. That's the interesting thing. Pe people are still reading this book. It's still every week. It's like, okay, who has still gone out? And people are still talking about it with me. It's like, this was one of the most interesting books. We see it all the time coming up out of our year end, what people read on reading group guides. It was one of the books. It was like, you know, this is what we want to talk about. It shows up a lot on those lists for sure. Mm -hmm. Um Couple more questions. Um, Bonnie asks, how much input does your editor have as you write? I actually write the whole book before I show it to her. I mean, at, for this next one that I'm working on, I am I came up with a kind of interesting structure for it. And so I'm, I'm actually this weekend, I'm gonna kind of clean up the first 50 pages and just, I just want her to say, yeah, I like it. You know, I, I like that, but we're not, we're not reading, she's not reading for content or anything. It's just like, does she like this structure? So, but other than that, I really wait until the very end. And, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of drafts and then I send it to her. And she, um, she, I've had many different editors now after having written so many books. And so each editor has a different style. So one of the things she does is an editorial letter that's about, I don't know, like 20 pages long, sort of what the book is about, what her questions are in each chapter, sort of looking at big picture stuff, but also little picture stuff. And then she sends, you know, she's also writing on the manuscript, which she sends to me too. So I really have two things. And then I, this can be for the writers out there, you know, I really look at editing, I, I kind of divide it into three sections. The first is, they're just wrong. <laughs> they were wrong. They, you know, they were, they didn't get enough sleep, whatever. They were just wrong. The next one is, oh yeah, they were, com that, that was, a, I have to fix that. And then there's this other category where they find something and it's, it's a thing where, and anybody who's written, you know, will know this feeling of there's something off here, but I, I haven't figured it out yet. Mm -hmm. But maybe someone will notice. <laughs> and then that, somebody notices because it's that little, it's just that little part that there's something isn't right. And so, you know, a, a lot of that work then I can just do by myself. But those, those ones that have that, if something, you know, I, I don't know how to fix it sometimes. I just don't know how to fix it. And so uh, we talk on the phone and sometimes, you know, we can get, I mean, she's not telling me what to do, but it's, but by my just talking through what my thinking is, that actually usually allows me to get to what I was trying to say, you know, and what I was trying to achieve. Um, but it, but it, I think that's a thing that's, you know, a really good editor is really helping you figure out what you what you were trying to do, you know, what you want to do and to get there. But it's not them telling you what to do. Right. It's like, here's a question. I have a question. Can you answer that question? And you're like, oh, wait, I didn't know that was a question. Or wait a second, do I have to really figure that part out? You know? Did nobody get it? Tom, is there something else? Uh, yeah, Myra asks, after reading the Red Princess trilogy, I wondered if you were concerned about being able to travel to China again. No, I mean, I wrote those a long time ago. <laughs> and I never, ever had any issues traveling um, to China or traveling in really remote areas of China. 
Um, I've, I've never once had a, a, a problem. Lisa, when you go to the remote areas, you mentioned you had a driver that one time. Do you look for somebody who's going to take you wherever you need to go? Or are there people you find along the way? You're going to some very remote places. Like, how do you do that? It's a combination. Sometimes um, I can find someone from here who uh, could be a driver. I mean, you know, travel agents don't really barely exist anymore, but there used to be a travel agency in Los Angeles, Chinatown, um, where, you know, they could find a driver for me, hmm. or they could find someone who spoke a particular dialect. I mean, that, that's been one of the harder things is, you know, finding somebody to drive you somewhere is pretty easy, but it's finding someone who knows that local dialect. Mm -hmm. Do you speak Chinese at all? My family spoke the Sayyap dialect. That's one of 1,200 dialects from Guangdong province. And, you know, I, I when I was a kid, I could understand some. Now all it would be would be food. I'm always down for food. <laughs> <laughs> and then I studied Mandarin for four years. And I, I, I got pretty good, actually. But the minute I stopped studying, it went right out of my head. Yeah. I really need people to help me. We'll wrap up the Q&A with this last question. Um, Cheryl says, Lisa, I love your book so much. I've had the pleasure of seeing you at a book event and sharing tea with you at one of these events a number of years ago. Um, and I have watched many virtual interviews with you. You're a gifted writer and a fun, special person. Each yeah. time you are wearing the same beautiful necklace. I'm so yeah. curious about this. If it's too personal, I totally understand if you don't want to address this, but if you care to do so, would you tell us about your gorgeous necklace and its meaning to you? Yeah, so this is actually three different necklaces and they're all gifts from my husband, but they go really nicely together. This one, um, I was in Tucson doing an event and it was about a bazillion degrees out, but I really needed to get out of the hotel room. And fortunately, right next door was a strip mall. And they had it, one of the stores was like, you know, where different artists sell stuff. And um, I saw this necklace and one other one, and I took pictures of them and I sent them to my husband and I said, you know, my birthday isn't coming. Uh, Christmas is a long way off. But those things do come around every year. <laughs> and so lo and behold, yeah, I got them. But I don't take these off. Um, I've worn these same exact earrings for something like 30 years. Um, this I've had on for, I don't know, it could be something like <laughs> at least 20 years. Oh. Um, bracelets are all things I've had for, you know, and I just put them on, they just stay on. Mm -hmm. Does that make me a lazy person? Probably but it's but I just love them and 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 they yeah they do mean something to me because they mm -hmm. you know, I did have there was another thing before this one that was a gift from my son and it was like a little $30 necklace or something you know, that he just went really big to get I me mean, for Mother's Day or something and that thing kept breaking all the time and I have to take it to the jewelry store so I I must have spent a fortune you know <laughs> rebuilding that thing over and over again because I loved it so much um and it was from him and then and then you know this this one came and that other necklace got to be retired so that it could be nice and delicate in a box yes in a box someplace but but treasured but treasured right. in that box well, I know a lot of people are asking you're working on something new now can you tell us anything about it yeah so um this one it has, as part of this historic backdrop, the 1871 Los Angeles Chinatown Massacre. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Los Angeles was just a dinky, dinky little Pueblo, only 5,000 people. And by comparison, San Francisco had over 150,000 people. So this was just a little dinky place. And it, it was actually considered to be the wildest of all of the wild west towns more gunfights more gunslingers more shoot 'em ups more hangings more lynchings than places like deadwood tombstone laramie durango you name it this was the most violent and wild and so uh at, during this massacre 10 percent of the population killed 10% of the Chinese. 
So 19 Chinese men and boys were, were stabbed, shot, and hung. It's considered to be one of the largest mass lynchings in the history of our country, but certainly the largest in California. And I'm telling this story from um, the point of view of three real women who lived through that time. So 190 Chinese in Los Angeles, 34 of them were women. Wow. And just think about what it must have been like for them, you know, here in this just wild, filthy, dusty place. Anyway. So one of them, she was uh, came here as a 15-year-old, you know, in an arranged marriage to a much, much, much older merchant. And uh, she wasn't here very long before she was kidnapped and she was held for about six months. Mm -hmm. And her kidnapping, it's believed to be the trigger for, for this massacre. Um, so I think of her as kind of the Helen of Troy of the piece. Mm -hmm. This one was the wife of the Chinese doctor. And while he did have Chinese patients, his main patients were, were white. And so he spoke four languages. He was very dapper, very well dressed, um, obviously very well educated, wore a diamond ring. And he was the second person to be killed. And then the third um, woman is actually a composite, again, of two real women who were sold by their families in China brought here and then sold into prostitution. So this is after the Civil War. Um, you know, slavery has been outlawed. The 13th Amendment is in place. There was one exception, and it had to do with the sale and ownership of Chinese women in the state of California. Wow. So these two women, from the moment they got here, they tried everything they could to escape and find freedom. So as of this more yesterday, I'm on page 145. So it's a thousand words tomorrow, maybe 146, page 146. <laughs> <laughs> I remember last week you were telling me like, I've done this many words while I was away on vacation. You kept working, no matter where you were, you kept on working. And that's mm -hmm. the game. That's absolutely the game. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. I tell you that with the comments you can see, I'll send you the chat later on. People have just been so thrilled to be part of this evening for all that you've shared. And that's one of the things I enjoy about you the most is you're so generous. You're generous with your readers and everybody knows that. And when book clubs meet with you and book clubs, well, she's writing now, just keep this in mind. It's one of the reasons we did this tonight. She's just one of those people that reaches out and gives her herself so much. And the number of people that you've reached out to, either with the handwritten notes or emails or with your newsletter, just everything that you do. It's so personal in keeping the author in mind, the readers in mind. And so for that, I thank you from the audience as well, because I see what people are saying, you know, very, very much touched. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so glad I got to be the January 1st uh, guest of the year. That's exactly, and that's exactly. I, going way back from an hour ago, that this does feel like the longest month on record. <laughs> About a week and a half ago, I said to my husband, what's the date? And he said, it was like the 10th. I said, of February? Because there is no way. And when, <laughs> last year, January went like this. This year, it is onward and onward and onward. And a lot of us were joking before that we felt like the holidays went like this. That week was over and out. And I can't wait to see what happens next year when it's on a Wednesday. Like when the holiday's on a Wednesday, what do you do? Take two weeks? What happens? I just feel like it's stop. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined me in. This was really fun. And for all those great questions, thank you. And to everybody who was here tonight, we've got a couple of more announcements. Um, tonight's event will be available on YouTube on a podcast later this week. And we will alert everyone who signed up when that is ready. And that email, we're also going to include a, a link to sign up for our new monthly email, events at the bookreportnetwork.com. So you can stay on top of all of our programming. Our next Bookachino Live event will be on Wednesday, February 28th at 8 o'clock at night. And our guest is going to be Shelby Bam Pelt. And we're going to be talking about her best-selling novel, Remarkably Bright Creatures. And future guests <laughs> are going to be Kristen Hanna and Kate Morton. So you will have all this information coming. And a reminder, we have 180 book reporter talks to author interviews available, including one that I did with Lisa when the book first came out. So if you want to hear even more, there's ways to go out and do that as well. So for everybody, thank you for joining us. Lisa, thank you again. And to everybody, here's to next time. <laughs>